Um, so yes, so welcome to uh, to everyone. Welcome. Uh, hopefully everyone is staying warm on uh, this chilly Thursday evening. Um, before I hand things over to Rick for tonight's program on tracking, I wanted to take a moment to thank our Nature Program Series sponsors, um, Hancock Lumber and Ragged Mountain Equipment for their continued support. I also want to thank all of you who are members of Tim Mountain. Your financial support as well helps us carry out our mission and our programming. Um, if you want, if you're not currently a member of Tin Mountain, I would encourage you to, to check that out right on our website at the top in the right is um, there's a support us tab. You can look into the various membership options. Um, if that's not something you're ready to do right now, another option um, again on that tab is just to donate directly to our nature program series um, to help us keep these programs going. Um, and we do, in terms of upcoming programs, we, you know, we're in the midst of, uh, of finalizing our late, late winter, early spring programs, uh, but we do have one fabulous uh, one that we're, we're excited about coming up um, a week from tomorrow, next Friday, February 19th. We have uh, Mark and Marsha Wilson, who have done Eyes on Owls with us over the years. Um, they are we are hosting an owl quest program. So it is um, a virtual live animal program, uh, the epitome of oxymorons, but actually we think it's gonna be pretty great um, and enable some, some views and up close uh, encounters that wouldn't be possible in, in a live program. Um, that is one that you have to register in advance for and you can um, find out the, the link and information to do that right on, um, right on our website, tinmountain.org. But I would encourage you to, uh, to join us for that. It won't be recorded um, and available after the fact. So it's a one night only deal. Um, also, uh, you know, since one of the advantages of, uh, you know, there has to be tiny advantages of remote living, uh, <laughs> remote programming, uh, is that you don't have to be here to watch the program. So if you have friends or family that you think would enjoy that, um, please do share that with them. Um, otherwise, as I said, we're very, we're excited. Um, you know, we have some, some new snow for a while. It was looking like we weren't ever going to get decent snow. Uh, but depending on where you are, you know, that the amounts vary. Um, but we are excited to have Dr. Rick Vanderpool, our, uh, our research director here at Tin Mountain presenting, um, a mammal tracking program, always good, um, you know, whether you are first time or, uh, you know, or a seasoned tracker, it is always good to brush up on your skills, um, whether it's a reminder or a first time. Um, I know we have offered, we do have a field component with this um, scheduled, but I believe both sessions that we have of that are full at this point. So um, if that's something that you're interested in, you'll have to, um, you know, just take the time to go outside tomorrow or Saturday on your own and utilize your, your newly, uh, you know, minted tracking skills. Um, so with that, I am going to, oh, I will say, I am going to mute myself in a moment, um, and I will probably mute anyone else who, um, who is not currently muted so that we don't pick up any un anticipated background noise um, for this presentation. Um, what I will say is if you have questions for Rick during the program, the best way to ask those is just to type them directly into the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. If you click on the little chat bubble, you should be able to type in a message to everyone. Um, I'll be monitoring that, um, that chat function. And if it's an immediate clarifying question, I can jump in. Uh, and, and ask that of Rick. Otherwise, I will um, wait and ask them of him at the end of the program, at which point you are also welcome to unmute yourself um, and ask questions directly of Rick. All right, and with that, my <laughs> dance routine finishes and I am going to hand things over to Rick. All righty, well, 
Thank you very much, Nora, for that great introduction. Um, it's my pleasure once again to do a tracking program uh, virtually tonight, but not unlike other times that I present at Tin Mountain. Um, we have the weekend workshops to look forward to for getting into the field. Tracking has been not too bad this year. I have to say it came a little late, but once it came in, we've had great conditions. Um, we've had some, you know, ups and downs of various species I'll talk about as we go through the, the slideshow. But in the meanwhile, uh, please do uh, use a chat function if you've got questions and we'll, we'll get to them as soon as we can. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we'll start the program. Okay, I will need to have Nora share. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Cool. All right. So we'll get this going. And I will. No, oh, it's already swapped. Okay. Can everybody see that? Nori, give me a thumbs up. All right. Very good. Um, this is a program that I've been doing since, uh, well, I guess 1985 in New Hampshire anyway. Um, when I was teaching in Antioch, we always did mammal tracking programs. Uh, Mead Caddo at the Harris Center often started those off. And then for my natural resource inventory class, I would teach mam mammal tracks and sign. Um, <clears throat> I've run uh, well over 100 kilometers of transect over the years and have aggregated uh, some 160 or 70,000 tracks in my transects. I've got a little bit of data to share with you tonight, but most importantly, we'll, we always start at the beginning. Um, you know, what's a mammal? Uh, this is Bio 101, so many of you I'm sure could probably teach this better than I. I saw a few folks in, on, the, on the participant list that are pretty experienced naturalists and and biologists, so uh, bear with me as I go through some of the background. Um, bearing mammary glands, that's sort of unique. Uh, fur bearing, that's another aspect that mammals uh, don't share with any other vertebrate class. Um, as you can see by, thank you, Gary Larson, um, the comic strip there, uh, it was, um, they arose after the dinosaurs, really is a little bit of a stretch there, but about 60, 65 million years ago, like Cretaceous and uh, most mammals, uh, of course, have been quadrupedal. We are one of the few bipedal mammals uh, in the world that, uh, you know, tops uh, several thousand species. The dentition is very diagnostic, and were I to um, uh, have a program in hand, as I have done in the past, I'd have a bunch of skulls out and we'd pass around the skulls and I'd have you look at the teeth and, and uh, run some of the tests. Like, okay, think about a skull and the teeth in that skull and what you can discern about their biology and ecology. And so if you have an opportunity to look at some skulls, I encourage you to do that. Um, especially if you have somebody throwing you, like I did a couple of weeks ago, a uh, elephant seal skull out. That was, that was a, I think I threw a few people off with that one. But nonetheless, because the last time I checked, there weren't any in New Hampshire. Um, the teeth alone can tell you what that animal is all about, whether they're predators, whether they're herbivores, they're omnivores, how large they are, what their musculature is, whether they're quadrupedal or bipedal. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting uh, study. I encourage you to look more into that. Um, understanding their adaptations is part of what I got into doing with uh, mammals many years ago. And of course, there's a lot to learn in, with our fur-bearing neighbors. And by now, having this screen up for more than a, a minute or so, you've no doubt found the camouflage critter in the middle here that came out upon a squeak on the back of my hand that I put out. And sure enough, an ermine popped out of the ferns one day. Uh, so we don't often see them because they're either nocturnal or they are uh, very well camouflaged, but there are ways around that. And I'll demonstrate some of those in a bit. 
Uh, keep in mind, we have uh, the Cyber Tracker Certification Program out there, so you can actually get online and learn more about tracking outside of this program, uh, getting onto the cybertracker.com uh, website and uh, take online classes. And um, it's there's a whole, yeah, there's a whole bunch of folks out there really into it. So basic terms, as we go through the species, there are three different components that I generally talk about with each species. The tracks, of course, are sort of the most important part of that, uh, but not necessarily what you're gonna find. And not only what you may find, for example, if you find scat or, or feces, um, there are different types of scat, they're bone scats, they're hair scats, and that's something else that we might be able to talk a little bit more in detail out in the field on Saturday if we've come across some, uh, which we no doubt will. Uh, but relative to the tracks, it's not just that you're looking at things like the hind foot versus the front foot. And uh, since I, you know, just for the sake of time, I'll, I'll give you the cue up on this. The front foot in canids and in felids and some of our other species are typically larger than the hind foot. And, you know, in a sort of classroom setting, I'd sit, ask you, why do you think that is? And people like Dave Gavatsky and I don't know, Lori and Nora and, <laughs> and maybe Katie would say, um, well, that's because, well, why? These are the driving feet. These are the ones that are grabbing the ground, need to be the most powerful and dexterous to turn quickly and chase down the prey species that they're after. Hence, they are stronger and wider and larger in most of our predator uh, mammals, predatory mammals. But it's not just the tracks, it's also what the movement patterns are. And we'll go over some of those as we move along. In terms of tracks, it's pretty simple. You've got toe pads, you've got metacarpal pads, which are these inner ones that relate to the inside of our, our hand, that's our metacarpals as it were. And then down at the bottom, we have our heel pad. And of course, if you're quadrupedal walking on the ground, that heel pad becomes very important relative to different things that you do. Notice that in this example, the opossum, the heel pad's not really well developed. Compare that with a primate like ourselves or a monkey or a chimpanzee. These are much more um, you know, heel pad dependent species and therefore in some animals uh, they're more well expressed than others. Um, for example, here's another uh, 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 animal that um, you can see is a gray squirrel, two and a half inches on this illustration. And of course we have again our five toe pads, this being the hind foot, okay, notice this the hind foot, uh, which is typical of rodents. And we'll talk more about uh, the number of digits in these, these critters that, we, that we're gonna see very shortly. The metacarpal pads, of course, are underneath the toes and the heel pad at the base, which again, for a, for a climbing or arboreal mammal, they're not as well expressed again as those that, the, as much as those that walk on the ground. And we'll see things like porcupine where the heel pad is much, much larger and much more important for the locomotion. So we start looking at tracks in a pattern and there's several, and we'll go over them. I've got a sort of a cheat sheet to show you, but in in you know in sort of the most some of the most common patterns we see, uh, and this is what every animal does is they walk, right? I mean, it could be a giraffe, a monkey, it could be a mouse. It doesn't matter. All mammals walk. Think about um, you know when you're thinking about. Uh, micro, microscopic organisms that are the larvae of, say, fish or amphibians, um, everything starts small. And every pattern starts slowly. From a stand, you walk. And you walk sometimes slow enough where your hind foot and your front foot are registering in the same pathway. This one is called a what they call a perfect walker. Uh, of a gray fox, and there is a direct registry of the hind foot uh, coming into the front foot pad it, or, or imprint itself, and therefore it looks like almost like a pogo stick going down through the snow. And this very straight, perfect walking pattern is diagnostic of, and I can just hear some of you raising your hand, canines, precisely. All right. 
So here's a couple of uh, sort of basics in terms of movement pattern. This is something I put together back uh, about 20, well, getting on 25 years ago. Um, and it goes through the some of the most common field guides which are out there should you want to learn more using the old fashioned method, a good hard copy book. <laughs> uh, yeah, some of us are old enough to have learned on books and we didn't have these online resources back then. So uh, one of the first ones I had was uh, Olas Muri's uh, field guide to mammal tracking. Uh, and that is, um, just a, a classic, but there are several others that have come out. And I took four of the most common ones and then compared the terminology used for these different track patterns. And as you go from A to M, you're generally going from slow to fast. All right. So again, from left to right, you're increasing in speed. And some of this will really help as we go through the different species because you may not actually find a really good track, right? The snow conditions right now are good enough to register tracks, but it's fairly icy and cold. And so the tracks may not be perfectly uh, outlined like you see behind my head in the screen screensaver. Um, and therefore a pattern will indicate or help dictate what that species actually is. So again, walking pattern, if you're real slow, notice that the hind foot, which is generally indicated on this chart by a dark or enclosed circle, and the front foot are slightly offset. That's a real slow pattern. As you gain in speed, the perfect walk, as I said before, is one where the hind foot registers in the front foot print, and therefore it looks like it's just a two-legged animal going through the snow. As you increase speed to a slow trot, or as a fast walk, as it might be called, you start to separate the hind and the front. But look again here, now the, the hind is starting to uh, lead ahead of the front feet as you go faster and faster. But pretty much at that speed, the efficiency of locomotion starts to drop and the hips have to come into a larger movement and start pairing up in a what they call a two by two trot, which is also a fairly you know, common pattern out there, especially with canines and felines. And then if you just stretch that even a little farther where you're starting to favor your shoulder from left to right, you have what they call a pace pattern. And that's where, again, it's a slow trot, but the hind foot is registering immediately opposite the front foot, uh, the trailing hunt front foot. And so that that's, uh, a, if you're a dog owner and you've ever done dog showing, uh, the pace pattern is one that is gets, you, you get marked off for points if you're trying to show a dog and they're pacing instead of doing a perfect walk or trot. Then things start to move a little faster in F and we begin to get into the what they call the loping patterns. And pretty much uh, all of our predatory species are lopers at that speed. The ones that aren't, we'll talk about soon, are the bounders or hoppers in largely the rodentia class. But in the predator groups, the carnivores and the mustelids and so forth, we have a four by uh, lope, uh, a slow lope here where you can just see a little separation between the hunt front and hind pairs, and then a four by lope where it looks like they're notes on a scale. And believe it or not, uh, there is one animal that we'll talk about that this pattern is the most common pattern for its movement through the woods or in the, in the open as the case may be. In certain carnivores, we have a one to one pattern where Again, it sort of looks like this, but in this case, the hind and the front, uh, the trailing uh, left front, uh, I should say the leading left front and the trailing right hind is almost next to each other. That's, for example, very common in our mustelid group or weasel family. And then uh, with the, again, the predators under eye, it breaks out to this larger pattern of a gallop. And that's, I mean, you can have, you know, pretty much most of our 
uh, predators do this, but also some of our herbivores like horses and artiodactyla, the deer and moose and so forth. You'll get your galloping pattern. The faster speeds for our rodents, however, are generally accompanied by their means, their strongest means of locomotion, and that is a, a strong imprinted hind foot. So both in the snowshoe hare, cottontail rabbit um, pattern where you've got the front feet generally in an opposing diagonal with each repeat, each uh, print, um, uh, that is, uh, again, utilizing that strong hind feet to escape predation, and then squirrels and mice and all the other rodents pretty much have mostly an evenly paired front and hind. Again, the front coming down first, the hind following as they bound away. Um, you have a couple of different faster movement patterns that are uh, not as well uh, expressed in the field, except for certain species. In the case of L, um, uh, you're looking at probably a mink that would do this pattern. Uh, that front left doesn't quite lead out uh, far enough to do a one-two-one of say a fisher. And that's uh, what you would expect with something like mink that has shorter legs than a fisher does relative to its body size. So that hopefully will give you a little bit of background of, of movement patterns and set us up to talk about some species. Uh, just a, a quick, uh, uh, reminder that uh, you can have in the gallop a rotary pattern where it looks like it's uh, what they call a clockwise or rotary pattern. And you can also just flip this image in the opposition and have a counter rotational pattern as well when you get to galloping. And some animals like uh, antelope will actually alternate their clockwise versus counterclockwise. Uh, galloping patterns, and some will more or less always stay in one, one position. Um, okay, so these are the species we'll talk about, uh, hopefully most of them. I'll have to run through them fairly uh, quickly. There's a few, <laughs> 35 plus or minus. And notice that everybody walks pretty much. Um, that's a very common pattern uh, that is indicated by this large X. And then some of them indicated by these dashes do other movement patterns. Um, if you look over here on the right, the jumpers and leapers are largely in this rodentia group and uh, silvalagid group, the, the, the rabbits and, and, uh, and hares. So those are the most common types of mammals that will jump or leap. And so if you see a jump or leap pattern, you're probably into this group, right? So this, again, this, also helps, and I can um, share this uh, online at the Tim Mountain website. You can download it and, um, and, and take a look at it yourself. Okay, we've all seen white moose, right? <laughs> I know some of you know where, have seen this picture, and, and perhaps you know where it was taken, but here's a hint, that's sagebrush. <laughs> We're out of the neighborhood. Although there have been white moose, recorded in the Northeast, they're pretty rare. All right, but this is how moose normally look, right? And in each of these slides, I have basically one slide per species. I try and indicate a few things about the habitat and the habits of the animal to help you be a good predictor of what track you're actually seeing. With good fortune, um, last I checked, we don't have any muskox or, you know, um, any other large ungulates, which simply mean you have these, these uh, the, the front two toes, which have evolved to become the dominant printmakers and the dew claws, as it were, the back two toes in this originally four toed animal are have raised up and are, are much higher than the front two toes in, in artiodactyl, the ungulates. Um, this unmistakable heart shaped pattern uh, there are very, very uh, few instances where you will mistake in this. Um, deep snow, if there are horses around, maybe so. <laughs> but other than that, there's nothing else that's going to be uh, of this size. Look at uh, scale. This is a good four to five inches in length, depending upon whether it's a calf or an adult. 
Uh, sometimes you see evidence of their scapulas in the woods, especially now that we've got a sort of a, a ongoing winter tick concern. Some of our younger animals, and this is from a two-year-old uh, moose, uh, are dying earlier than they should relative to how and live. Often you'll see the pellet groups. This is their scat uh, pile in, on the snow or in the woods. And uh, interestingly, I've done a small study of, of moose scat and found that on average, you have between 250 and 500 pellets per group. I've got an, a mean in there someplace, but that, that I won't tell you what that is because I A, don't remember and B, don't want to admit that I was a scatologist for a while. Uh, moose are great animals, very easy to see uh, when you come across them. However, they are very quiet in the woods and it's more often than not, you will either see their track or their scat long before you see the animal itself. Our other uh, hoofed animal, the wild, I should say, uh, in the Artiodactyla uh, order is uh, Autocoileus virginianus, our white-tailed deer. And notice in this uh, illustration, um, as the speed increases, these uh, digitate toes start to separate to give the animal greater traction as they're running along. So you may see that in a galloping pattern, you will not see these toes spread in a walking pattern. There you'll just typically see these heart-shaped um, uh, patterns. And notice too that there, are, there have been situations where you might come across deer that are in a, a farm yard or field and confuse them with sheep and pigs. I remember um, being in uh, uh, the Galapagos and looking at goats and goat tracks and trying to figure out if they were uh, anything but uh, uh, the introduced goat down there because there's some similarities to those track patterns. But here you have a, a two and a half to three inch uh, size that's well below the size of a moose. There are very few uh, sort of instances where you could be confused and that would be of course with a, a calf moose uh, that's pretty small just born and it would be of course in the in the summertime. Uh, deer scat of course are pelletized like moose except in the summer when eating fresh marsh vegetation or wet vegetation they can actually have sort of a soft pile of scat but normally you'll see the pellets as an indicator of uh, their their presence. Keep in mind that deer, like almost all mammals, uh, require fresh water. Um, and mostly on a daily basis, it's occasional when they will go without drinking uh, during a given day if there's a, a high, you know, a heavy snowstorm and they're yarded up. But at the absence of fresh water, I should say the presence of fresh water will help dictate, especially in the wintertime where these animals might, might tend to congregate. Uh, there's a lot more I could say about Deer, most of you are very familiar with this species. Um, uh, it was uh, with some good fortune in, in uh, this was late May that I captured a picture of this pregnant female. Uh, looked like she's about to have uh, twins in this instance based on the size of her, her belly. Okay, so uh, we're moving into now a little, a different group, uh, Ursidae, the uh, bear family. And for us in the Northeast, we pretty much have just this one species, black bear, Ursus americanus. And what is fascinating about this animal, not unlike moose, is that once they move someplace, you can generally track them. <laughs> it's not hard to find uh, bears out and about. And I might say that you, you say, well, winter, yeah, they should be sleeping. Um, I have now had three winters in the last 10 years where bears were out every month of the year. So things are a changing, as they say. Um, it's not a good plan when you're building up body fat uh, in the fall, summer and fall to expend that fat in the middle of the winter, especially if you're trying to raise, raise young. Uh, but I have seen that and hopefully, you know, today and this, this winter, not so much. I'm sure everybody's, uh, uh, they're pretty much sleeping at this point. It's nice and cold. Bear tracks have a huge heel pad, which is different of course, than some of the animals that we talked about. Uh, they're five-toed, both front and back. They have kind of a, a pigeon toe walk, uh, and that's also very diagnostic. And you can see here in this uh, illustration where one was walking 
uh, in the opposite direction of the other uh, in the same line, just to so show how these five uh, toe pads and the large metacarpal pad and single heel pad print out in the snow. Uh, of course, they climb trees, as you well know, especially beech, each beech, beech nuts. Uh, it took me a while before I learned the fact that, that most of the beech trees are fully leafed out when they're climbing because that's when the beech nuts are at full size but are still green enough uh, that they're quite a bit more palatable than when they are dry, brown, and fallen on the ground. Of course, that doesn't stop bears from grazing after a good uh, mast year for beech nuts on the ground for beech nuts, uh, but that's one of their uh, primary food sources that provide the oleic and linoleic acids uh, to build up that fat layer in the fall. Um, these are uh, you know, very adept climbers. They're also uh, omnivorous and that they are, have no problem uh, taking down a, a fawn or a moose calf um, and will eat bird, egg, bird nest eggs and so forth. They're, they, uh, they have quite a wide, wide diet. <clears throat> But their pattern, which you will see in snow either late in the fall, early winter, or late in the winter, is very diagnostic. So we have a couple of, you know, just a little bit of a live action. Um, bears, when they are uh, coming out of their, uh, it's not true hibernation, they call it either estivation or false hibernation, as it were, when they're coming out of their period of dormancy, which is a better, a better term, uh, they're pretty hungry. And this female was a two-year-old, had learned about bird feeders. Um, and fortunately, by this time, I had brought my feeder in. Um, and so I, you know, which I have typically, I typically did in sort of the first or second week of April, this is now the third week of April, and you can see by the general lollygagging that it's doing, it's just waking up, just coming to, and looking for some early food sources. There's some green grass, which is, you know, she passes up. She's looking for that feeder that she smelled <laughs> in the fall, and uh, with good fortune, again, I had already taken it, taken it down. This was taken outside my kitchen window, by the way. <laughs> ah, yes, the feeder bear. So not unlike uh, black bears, we have sort of miniature bears in the Procyonidae, the raccoon family. We just have one species in the Northeast. Uh, there's a couple others in, in the Americas in this family, um, uh, Quotamundi or Quadi. Uh, um, but nonetheless, we have this five digitate, so five toes on the front and the hind, um, arboreal, so climbs like bears do, omnivorous like a bear, but just quite a bit smaller. Um, you'll see that a two and a half inch estimate on the front foot, four inch on the hind, that's a full grown adult. Uh, if you look at this scale, which is a six inch scale, yeah, you might get three inches on the hind foot of this animal. So it's probably a, you know, a, a younger, certainly a juvenile. But that's very typical for the pattern for raccoon. Um, you have, um, in this case, uh, a hind and a front registering next to each other. Uh, like I said, almost that pacing uh, pattern that I uh, illustrated earlier. And that's very, very common. The hind foot registering right next to the front foot. That's the most common movement pattern for raccoon. You can have them stretch out a little bit um, as they start to gallop along. Uh, but again, this opposition, uh, if you get this pattern, you think it might be a bounder, look closer because one of these uh, imprints is smaller than the other. And that's a sure sign indicator. You got a front and a hind next to each other and you can pretty much go home and say you saw a raccoon pattern. That's its most common. Uh, the scat, very blocky um, and about a half inch to five eighths inch in diameter. Typically, um, the excrement is typically found at the base of uh, a den tree or, or a, a resting tree. And they're very, very fond of white pine. So if you want to find raccoon scat, 
um, go to the base of a large white pine that has ample branches and preferably a cavity or two up above, and you'll probably find scat at the base. Muscle arminia or, uh, or ermine, some people call the short-tailed weasel, um, is a very diminutive animal that now brings us into the Martin family or weasel family, mustelidae. And not unlike Procyonidae, you have five toes in both the front and the hind. But look at the orientation. Now, it's starting to be a little different. The toes are not nearly as long. The claws are quite a bit longer because these are highly predatory animals. And there's hardly any heel pad. This is an animal that will climb trees on, in a heartbeat. This is an animal that runs very quickly. So the heel pad is not very well expressed uh, in the mustelidae. And you'll see that in the other species we talk about. Um, just for scale, this is a red squirrel bounding in this direction. And the mustelid, in this case, the ermine is bounding across in this way. So there's two by two pattern, two by two, two by two. That's very, very common. Here's your two by two. And what's interesting about the mustelids, and that's something to keep in mind, is that you have a, a sexual dimorphism that uh, is expressed throughout the species. Uh, unless you're dealing with young, which don't typically, uh, um, you don't see because they're, you know, mostly full grown by the time that, that you get winter tracking anyway. Uh, you have a large, much larger male to a much smaller female. And you'll get an overlap. So in this right hand picture, the scale shows that the outside width or what they call the straddle of this track is less than two inches. And I'm pretty confident that if I have a straddle less than two, it's an ermine. If it is between two and two and a half inches, especially in good snow conditions, I can't tell if it's a male ermine or a female long tail weasel. And we'll see that next. And I'll show you how the patterns are very, very similar and the size range does overlap. So if you're in snow, it's deep, or I should say soft snow, it's a little, it's pretty tricky. Uh, every so often, you'll get lucky and see this bright white flash in the woods. This one, for scale, you can see it's got a, an animal in its mouth. <laughs> I looked at this uh, through my camera lens and saw that it was a short-tailed shrew. So that dark object is a shrew to give you a scale of how small this predator is, and which is why, as some of you no doubt know, ermine can fit right through your uh, uh, chicken wire and, and sort of decimate in a heartbeat, uh, either chickens or other small, small livestock, uh, rabbits and so forth. So here's the long tail. And again, the pattern is similar. It's a two by two, but when you measure it out, you'll get something that's generally two and a half inches to three inches. If you have a real big long tail, it could be three and a quarter. Uh, that was about this size right here. And there is a possibility of an overlap with the next size up mustelid, which we'll talk about uh, soon. But the pattern is going to be typically a two by two on your long tail. And that's gonna separate it from the next size up, which is typically a one, one, two, one or one, three pattern. Also notice if you're in the summertime, uh, you tend to see these uh, longer tail, black tipped, uh, you know, dark brown backed white underside long tail weasels. They tend to uh, be fair, fairly shy and retiring. Uh, and it's more often than not that you'll see uh, their scat uh, typically again in a, in a posted in a sort of territorial uh, fashion. That is to say on a high spot, stone wall, top of a rock in moss. And notice in this case, it's, I, I had to peel this apart many years ago and, and learned that um, uh, long tails are, are fairly fond of carpenter ants. So if you see a carpenter ant scat, um, it's, and you know that it's not a pileated woodpecker because there's no, uh, you know, any, any kind of whitewash in there. And if it's tapered on the tip, it's probably a weasel and most likely a long tail. That's just one of the uh, other signs that you could come across. Uh, on the track transects, uh, long tails in my uh, experience has been anywhere from about one to three to one to five relative to ermine. So ermine are quite a bit more common. And of course, you know, you could be in a locale where there are more long tail uh, weasels than short tail, but that's pretty, pretty rare in the state. 
So here's the next size up mink. And mink, of course, are riparian species. So you tend to find them along streams and waterways at the edge of ponds that might have a break in the ice that allows them to access food sources underwater in the winter. And that's gonna be the best indicator of the fact you've got a mink, uh, especially since the size will overlap with a long tail weasel. Uh, <clears throat> but notice in the mink pattern, you have a sort of a concentration of the tracks this one is a good example in the lower right, you'll see a one, two, one, it's almost like a one, three pattern. And that is pretty indicative of a very short legged, uh, sleek bodied animal, right? Even long tail weasels have longer legs uh, by their, according to their body uh, length than wink, minks, mink do. And so you'll have these shorter legs registering a closer, tighter pattern next to each other. In good conditions where the snow is not deep, you'll see the standard two by two. And if you look close, you can see all five toes here, one, two, three, four, five, and the metacarpals showing, but a very, very tiny dot for a heel pad. And you'll see that there's hardly anything down here in the heel pad area. And that's again, common for mustelids. So mink, pretty, uh, pretty versatile animal. Um, most mustelids have very dark colored scat. Uh, mink being uh, good predators uh, will typically have, um, if they're not eating shellfish, they'll have, uh, you know, hair left in the, these pointed dark scats uh, near water, and then and, and you know that they've been there. Mink will overlap in size with uh, American Martin, or what some people might know as Pine Martin, Martis Americana. Um, I thank Jill Kilborn, who was a presenter at Tin Mountain not too long ago for this picture. She also provided me with this picture of a um, pine marten <laughs> feeding at a scent post next to a fisher. So, you know, this is showing you two mustelids side by side for size. A pretty darn good picture that shows that, yeah, when it comes to food in the wintertime, they will, you know, sort of where it looks like they're putting aside their, their, um, their differences and feeding together, right? But notice this line right here. <laughs> yeah, this was pasted, two pictures pasted together. These, these guys are, as, as all muscles are, pretty much mortal enemies and would never get that close. This is sort of a trick picture. Um, the one thing about pine marten in terms of the tracks, they're generally going to be instinct. And keep in mind, these guys are absolutely adapted to boreal environments. Uh, their primary prey species is snowshoe hare. Um, they're dependent upon uh, the sort of snow conditions to create good habitat for browse for snowshoe hare because that's their prey, primary prey. And as a result, they've got a fairly furry foot in the wintertime. And that's going to obscure any toe pad registry that you can generally find. So if you find something that is indistinct and has a two by two pattern and in the right size class, as you see here with this two inch compass measurement, uh, compass uh, width, uh, you'll see that you're, you know, you're into a, a pine mark. Uh, we're sitting here at the southern edge of its rain, natural range in the edge of the White Mountains, um, but that range is expanding, which is why I had to change this slide from state threatened to state special concern. Uh, they're no longer on the state threatened or endangered list. Let's see how we're doing for time here. Oh, not too bad, okay. Um, <clears throat> Fisher, the next size up in that picture you saw before, uh, classic uh, brownish animal with a long, uh, almost prehensile tail. These are very good climbers like all weasels are. Uh, long nails, and you will see those long uh, um, uh, nails or claws uh, expressed in a good track registry like this, the five toes very clearly uh, showing. Um, the one two one pattern is the most common movement pattern for the speed that Fisher moved through the woods. You can get, of course, uh, variations on that, but here's a one two one. Uh, this is a one sort of three not unlike the mink. And again, it really depends upon uh, uh, where they are, how fast they're moving, whether they're going uphill or downhill, how deep the snow is and so forth. But in good conditions, you can see that 
the patterns get very consistent. So here's a one, two, one, one, two, one, one, and then two. Um, so that was uh, fish. And moving on to our one of our remaining uh, weasels, the uh, striped skunk. It's actually been placed in its own family in the two past, and uh, the phytidae uh, used to be in the mostelidae. And it's largely because of um, its difference in behavior and, and physiology. Uh, this animal is not nearly as well adapted to surviving winters. It's not nearly as predatory on other fur bearers as it is predatory on invertebrates. And it also uh, largely goes into a torpor state in the dead of winter. Uh, and only wakes up when it's you know a good warm thaw day. Uh, I did have them out in January um, uh, this this year, but that's not always the case. Uh, and I'm sure they're down sleeping at this point in time. So this is the animal I mentioned before that has this sort of descending notes on a scale pattern that John Coolish taught me about. And he would draw a little line up from each foot track and say, it looks like descending notes on a scale. That's how I remembered it. Um, and yet it will also, in this sort of loping pattern, a two by two lope, as you see illustrated in the snow here, and when it's moving a little bit faster, it will start to separate out those front and hind feet as it moves along. Uh, skunks are excellent um, diggers. They excavate burrows, they uh, dig down for um, grubs uh, to eat. And as a consequence, it's not uncommon to see long nails uh, in, and fairly long toes as well in whatever pattern you see the skunk leaving. In our last uh, extant species of mustelid in the Northeast, uh, whereas we used to have wolverine and we no longer do, uh, is otter. And that's our largest mustelid currently uh, in the Northeast. And it just you know, ramp everything up in size. You got five toes, they're much larger, two and a half to three inches in length for the left front uh, or right front for that matter. And the hind feet tend to be three and even up as much as four inches. And you can see that in this scale, four, this is a six inch scale. And you can see that these feet are clearly four inches across and there are no other muscleids that are of that size. Um, you do have a slight sexual dimorphism with males larger in otters as well, but it's not nearly as noticeable as it is in fisher, long tail, uh, weasels, uh, and martens. And notice that uh, we, you know, the easy pattern to see, of course, otters slides down the snow and will often run across open water bodies and bound and then slide and then bound a little bit more. But what is interesting, what uh, interest for at least for me was that the first time I saw uh, an otter going into an active beaver lodge was at Tin Mountain. And this, I think this is from the late 90s, one of the earlier programs I did there. Uh, we, and at that time, the beaver had a lodge down at the <clears throat> south end of the pond, Chase Pond. And this otter was clearly going in and out of the beaver lodge. And since that time, I've seen a lot of that sort of sympathy between beaver and otter in the winter time. Um, and there's actually good records of um, muskrats sharing beaver lodges with otter <laughs> and beaver at the same time in the winter time. So it's, a, it's an interesting, uh, you know, sort of adaptation that uh, is reflective of, um, of huddling I'll talk about in a minute. Other carnivores, red fox, yeah, I, I had to put this in. This was uh, entitled Deep Trouble. <laughs> um, yeah, Fox and the Hounds. Fox, typical canine. And in this case, four toes, hunt, front and hind. And notice again, the front foot, as I mentioned before with coyote, is a little bit larger than the hind foot for the reasons I explained. They say about 12 inches, it can be anywhere from 10 to 14 inches or more on a walking pattern that you see red fox, uh, their, their perfect uh, gait stepping. Um, but even in this sort of not perfect snow condition, you can see what is called the X pattern in the canine. 
So there is a line that is created by an indent in the middle part between the metacarpals and the heel pad in all canines, and that forms this X pattern. And we'll compare that um, with uh, felines or cats that have a different, have an H pattern. We'll see that in a minute. So there's your perfect sort of stepping pattern of a red fox going across a field. Um, and this just gives you a little bit more a comparison of size between male and female, which there is a slight size difference. Males, again, tending to be a little larger. Uh, males also have um, different patterns of behavior and uh, scent marking at this time of year when they're, they've just sort of finished breeding. Uh, they're still moving in pairs, at least as far as my game cameras indicate. Um, and those that are paired up. And uh, they are tend to be just, like I said, just a little bit larger. Gray fox, uh, another fairly common uh, four-toed canine. Um, that's sort of being repetitive because all canines are, as far as I know, um, are fairly widespread. Um, I've got them at my house uh, on a regular basis. Uh, equally as much as red fox, although they will tend to go a little bit more up and down in their populations over the years than red fox, at least been my experience. Red fox, for example, uh, subject to uh, rabies like all canines are, um, uh, and that has a, a significant effect on the prey base that they're in competition with relative to the gray fox. Um, <clears throat> gray fox, they call the cat-like canine. And if you look at the outline of the feet in gray fox, they're fairly round. Um, this, uh, what they have marked here is two and a quarter inches is absolutely wrong. Uh, no offense to Audubon who put these out. It's more for the illustration and one and a quarter, one and three quarter for the hind foot. That's absolutely wrong. I've never seen a, a gray fox with <laughs> that large a foot size. Uh, this is more like a coyote size than, than a fox. Generally, your length is about an inch and a quarter on the front foot uh, to an inch and a half, uh, and about an inch to an inch and a quarter width on, on both the front and hind feet. The front being the more powerful and slightly larger foot tends to be fairly round, and that's largely because, as many of you know, gray fox are tree climbers, and they have the ability to use those front feet to shimmy up a tree and go after prey. In deep snow, they'll sort of waddle a little bit, but still try and seek out that uh, perfect stepping pattern where the hind foot registers with the front foot. Um, and here you have uh, two fox, two gray fox moving together with the front foot being a little rounder here and a little bit more oval in the hind foot, but nonetheless, space as you can see on the size here, about an inch and a quarter or so in width. Uh, coyotes, Eastern Coyote, Canis latrans VAR period, um, very uh, widespread, successful canine filling in the niche that wolves have left wide open uh, now that we no longer have wolves with any of any consequence in northern New England. Um, even at a bait site like this, they can be very territorial with their mates. Uh, there's a distinct pecking order involved, right? And that's how uh, uh, pack animals like coyotes uh, tend to behave. Uh, the male gets to feed first, the female feeds afterwards. And if the male's not done, he will let uh, the female know that, that, that she's, she's got to wait in line. It isn't always an alpha male that is dominant in a pack. It can be an alpha female if there is a pack disruption due to trapping, roadkill, hunting, you have it. Uh, and that's one of the greatest reasons we have a fairly high coyote population in the state is because of uh, the, pre the predation, depredation uh, pressure uh, by humans of all, all types. Um, there's scat, standard sort of uh, long, generally tapered scat. Uh, this is a little bit blockier than most scat, um, but nonetheless, if you see a scat that's uh, fairly long, six to seven, eight inches long, uh, they can be as much as an inch in diameter. That's getting a little large. Three quarters is more typical. 
then you probably have a coyote scat. They are perfect walkers. Here's your front foot and your hind foot in a very slow walk, which is why they're separate here. And I was able to take this picture. Um, and that was similar. This is a, a blow up of that pattern right here on the left. And this is more, as you can see, a little bit closer to the truth, two and a half inches length on the front foot, two and three quarters or so on the hind foot. Uh, and that's going to be an average adult uh, male in that size class. So in bobcats, you start getting into the, the feline, what they call the H pattern. Notice you can't draw a nice, neat, straight line down between uh, <clears throat> the back side of the left toe and the upper right toes. It's more of an H pattern. And that's pretty typical for canines, uh, excuse me, felines. Um, uh, bobcats really are only common uh, cat wildcat in the Northeast. We do have a few links I'll talk about in a minute, but uh, bobcats are really the, the most common. Typical pattern here, as you can see, is their offset. So look at the shoulders. The shoulders in these guys are a lot wider, and that's because they are regular tree, cl tree climbers, right? Whereas dogs really can't climb trees, um, and gray fox are the exception to the rule with a slight ability to, to climb up a tree. The bobcats are regular tree climbers and they hunt in trees, they rest in trees, they'll escape uh, predation in trees if they're being hunted by another bobcat or something larger, even a coyote, I've seen them go up in trees. So and that's one reason the shoulders are wider and that's why you get this slight offset to the pattern as you go through the snow. They like to, of course, den in rocky areas, talus slopes, base of cliffs, southeast, southwest facing uh, solar gaining sites so that by April they've got some uh, a little bit more sun as the snow is still melting and the young are being born. Two inches, pretty good average for an adult bobcat, two inches long, two inches wide, pretty consistent, slightly shorter than the hind foot but that isn't always the case. Um, this, if I were to measure, this is generally two inches. If you have something that's inch and seven eighths or inch and three quarters, you probably have a young of the year. And that's, you know, really the only time you're gonna see that the first winter that these kids are after they've been born, they'll be that size class. Then by the second year, they'll be a full two inch size on the average. So we did have some links that were uh, discovered uh, by tracks. Mark Elbrock, who wrote a mammal track guide, um, um, was doing some work with Rose Graves up, up in Jefferson and uh, asked Dave Gavatsky about this. He knows all about it. Um, I would say, though, that lynx, even though that they're boreal obligate, um, there's some question as to how, how far they have uh, gotten. Um, we had, as reported here, it says early 90s, it was actually 1989. There was a lynx killed on Interstate 89 <laughs> uh, down in Sutton or down in that area. I'm pretty sure it was in Sutton or close to that area. It might have been New London. But in any case, way out of range, according to what we thought that where lynx could naturally occur. So when I took this cat track that was three, three to three and a quarter inches in, in size across and length in the Osby Mountains back 20 years ago, I, I had to take a double take because uh, the size of the pattern, the size of the track was clearly outside of the bobcat range. Uh, there was a supposed sighting in the Ospies around that time. So I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced but it's possible that this was a dispersing individual that didn't obviously stay and, and reside. Our only current residential links are up in Maine and, and yeah, just on the edge of, uh, I think up in Errol. And again, check with Dave uh, on, on what the current link status is, but I, I predict they will be uh, denning in our state if they haven't already done so in the near future. Last but not least on the felines are the cougars. And of course, I have to put this in because well, Here's some scat that was rather suspicious uh, that I found on the Squam Range. And I thought, well, it's sort of interesting that I had a bunch of cougar reports for this animal around the lakes region back in the early 2000s um, and up to about 2009. And I got lucky enough to find fresh scat uh, on Mount Larkham in the Ospies in 2004. Uh, I sent it off to be analyzed and it came back positive. 
uh, well, what they said was, and I quote, no significant difference between the PCRA of this um, uh, SCAT that you submitted and a, a confirmed, uh, in this case, it was a Colorado uh, baseline PCRA. So now I'm convinced that they are here on a regular basis, or an irregular basis rather. We might see one every few years. I think the Connecticut cougar that came from South Dakota was a was proof in point that that we can have cougars in this area. All right, I am. I think that we're getting close. I've got two more species I'm going to talk about without uh, going crazy. I could keep going for another hour, but I know that this is a long time to be sitting for everybody. So. Uh, first is, is, is snowshoe hare, um, and snowshoe hare, Laporte, is its own uh, family. It's slightly different than our cottontails in the sense that they're slightly larger, uh, actually much larger. They have much longer ears. They have a little bit different physiology, but their track patterns are very similar. And this is one of the, our, our larger bounders, right, with the diagonal fronts that register and then the big hind feet coming in behind. And it's those hind feet that allow these guys as a primary prey species in the Northeast to escape predation. They can speed over 30 miles an hour in a, in a heartbeat and uh, just, but they don't have a long, long endurance, but they can, uh, you know, use their camouflage and uh, evade predators very efficiently. And that's what they do in their preferred habitat, which includes areas like this, some dense young sapling, forests, which we have a lot of post, post logging across the state, and also in scrub shrub swamps, as you see over here on the left. And it's not uncommon to see uh, little pellets, which, uh, as you may or may not know, uh, the Laporidae and Silvalagidae are uh, coprophilus. They'll eat their own pellets until there's really no food left. Um, and then at the right time of year, which is uh, usually late December, early January, you have um, you know, females and estrus, and you can sometimes see the blood in the urine uh, for these animals as well. But Laporte, these are um, really a, a, a very common uh, animal that uh, in the winter time around here that does does in fact go in, up and down in their populations. Uh, but right now we, we seem to have a fair, fairly good population of them. I think they're probably still climbing to their peak. They certainly haven't crashed by any means. All right, so the last species I'll talk about is uh, porcupine. It brings us into the rodentia class. And it, um, in rodentia, as many of you know, we have uh, long uh, incisors that uh, need to be worn down through constant chewing. Otherwise, uh, they will grow into the lower jaw and prevent an animal from feeding. And I've seen skulls where that has happened of animals that died of starvation, and in this case, a beaver, because they could not. Um, they, they were, you know, inhibited from chewing them uh, down fast enough. Uh, porcupines are creatures of habit. They'll create trails like this back and forth, back and forth between their overnight resting locale, which might be a low hemlock, or it might be a, a, um, a treetop cavity, or it could be a large upturned root mound where they nestle underneath or uh, a large, the bowl of a large hardwood, uh, anything that's suitable to keep them out of the weather. And then they move from their feeding locale back and forth uh, throughout the winter. Once they're in a loca location, they usually stick. And if they're in one location like this uh, site near a talus slope, generation upon generation of porcupine will actually create um, sort of a, a, a gnarly, you know, browse down uh, uh, you know, dwarf hemlock forest, uh, sometimes dwarf beech or sometimes dwarf striped maple, but they will browse this on a regular basis and force these otherwise tall trees, as you can see with the trees around them, into these low growing patterns. And there you, you're, you're, you're clearly in an area where they have, um, they're residential and they've been there for a long period of time. Um, our North American sloth, as it were, will overheat in the summer and try and cool off in the breeze of higher limbs. Um, they're really curious individuals being well protected by their spines or quills, I should say, and, um, and therefore they haven't learned to or needed to run very fast. So the walking pattern is pretty much it. You might call it a shuffle. 
Uh, it's about the, the story of them. So this, this introduces a whole group of uh, animals I, I don't have time tonight to talk about when we get to that in our next our next session on, on uh, the smaller rodents, what we call the small mammals. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. And um, Nora, I see we've got a right. couple. Yes, um, there were a few comments that came in and some, you know, not surprisingly ones <laughs> that have to do with the, uh, some, some bobcat, so I'm uh, sorry, mountain lion, comments um okay trying to go through um oh so dave um in response to to some of the links information says there is yeah. a small breeding population of canada lynx up in no northern coos um from success township north uh, i would encourage anyone who missed we did have um Jillian Kilborn um, back in November present on um, some of the multi-year findings um, on fishing game and their collaboration with Maine and Vermont um, on their Lynx project. Um, and we do have that on our YouTube channel. Um, if people want to look, there's a lot of numbers in that one um, and some interesting stuff. And then, yeah, so another and a sighting of, yeah, um oh yeah sighting of lynx crossing 20 route 20 in Ossipi, uh 20 years ago well that's that's about when i took that picture um i might suggest though that they don't really have long tails uh, you're talking about seven eight inches uh as i recall so they're not not you know anything close to being like mountain lion length uh they are fairly similar proportionally in size uh, to a bobcat tail. It's a little bit longer, but the biggest deal with uh, lynx is most, you know, um, uh, they look like they're, you know, uh, elevated in their hind end and, and walking on short front legs. They've got a distinct um, uh, body position. They also are very long legged and, and sort of skinny in body relative to the, the length of their legs. And that too is different from a bobcat, which is quite a bit chunkier and uh, more compact, right? So I, a couple of things I'm to keep in mind. I, I was, you know what, when I read that comment, I was thinking they were talking about a mountain lion and I wonder oh. if they mistyped it. Maybe so. Um, well, maybe who, this Marie, so Marie, maybe you can clarify if you thought it was a mountain lion, because, um, yeah, there's a whole deal. <laughs> Porcupine bonsai, indeed. Yeah, that's that was, that's actually, I think, what I call those trees. Um, <laughs> bonsai trees. And and it's great. Porkies are, you know, they don't, no, no bones about it. They'll strip up beach and whatever they can get and, and keep at it. Um, and of course, many people have, have, have a lot of comments about porcupines being so uh, plentiful and in some ways a, a nuisance, as it were, or at the very least um, uh, a hazard on the roads. And that's, again, largely because we've we've uh, have very low fisher population. It's been going down since uh, 1979. Um, and uh, we're trying to correct that fact by limiting uh, trapping. A fisher to a certain extent. The Fish and Game Commission is currently discussing what their trapping limits are. They proposed keeping it the same, and yet we're seeing less and less fisher. So um, I would encourage, and I have, uh, uh, you know, that the commission consider a, a moratorium on trapping fisher, at least for a few years to get them back, because we are getting a lot of porcupines out there, and fisher are the singular animal that's the best adept at, um, at, at keeping the porcupine population down. So. All right. Other questions. Um, Tony, can you, um, did you want to share the track photo that you had right now? Um, you should be able to um, share your screen if you want to, to I'm trying to find you on the. Um, oh, here we go. He has a track that he was going to. Sure. Oh, this is great. Yeah, I should, I should, could have said, oh, bring your tracks. Aha. Oh, no. oh, that's awesome. I call this murder. It is murder. 
Although there's something about like, you know, when you go to the store and you buy a pack of hamburger meat, do you call it murder? <laughs> no. <laughs> but indeed, uh, we have a small mammal that is running along with a tail that looks like probably a deer mouse based on the, the tail drag there. And then whoosh, being taken away by likely an owl. That would be my bet. Yeah, that's, I figured maybe barred owl. Is that yeah. a mixed forest? Yeah. That's a great shot, Tony. Yeah, I was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's hiking down a trail, and here it is. Yeah, great. it's a good thing owls aren't any bigger, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's great. All right. Thank you for that, Tony. Um, does anyone else have, does anyone else have any questions? Um, for Rick, if you, you are welcome to um, unmute yourself and ask any questions. Um, of him directly. Now's your chance. <laughs> I know. Otherwise, I would um, see you Saturday. <laughs> yeah, we'll see some of you guys Saturday. Some of you Saturday. <laughs> I would uh, encourage folks just to to go out and and see what you can find. And with all this new information, you know, just taking a closer look at at some of the tracks you see just right around your house. Yep. Nora. Yes. Hi, this is Marie. I want to go ahead and ask the forbidden question as far as something <laughs> that's a large cat with a long tail. I mean, I okay. know what I saw that day. Yeah. Okay. So Marie, that's, uh, yeah, I've, there are a few of us that have, John Harrigan, Eric Orff, a couple others uh, that have kept tallies of mountain lion sightings in the state. I'm sure uh, Dave Gavatsi has got a few stories he could tell too. Um, and you know, again, we've we've there were a lot there was a lot of skepticism uh, on the part of Fish and Game Department whether or not we had any mountain lions in the state. Uh, once that one was um, killed and very, you know, obviously, uh, an, you know, out of towner, uh, in this case, tracked all the way from from South Dakota, um, we realized that dispersers from that nearest natal site are very possible in the Northeast, especially New England's, where you've got ample amounts of deer to support a large cat. So, you know, the, the sort of semi-official uh, position on that is that they are an occasional disperser. We do not have any breeding population. And it's my prediction, very unlikely that we ever will, because let's face it, if, if a single cat can be seen in 14 different locations as it went, and that's just the, the reported ones, as it moved from South Dakota to Connecticut, uh, it's probable that we would have, you know, everybody and their uncle knowing about the mountain lion up in Colebrook if there was one to set up shop and decide to reside for a while. So it's very unlikely because uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, humans as predators and competitors, um, have yet to, how shall I say, uh, get an attitude adjustment about uh, leaving uh, big cats alone. And so we will continue to uh, uh, eliminate them as they come into the state whenever we can, at least the people that care to. Uh, and the same goes with wolf. We would have wolves, wolves here as well. We actually had a, a, a couple of different wolves in Northern Maine that came in and they were, you know, shot by hunters um, thinking they were large coyotes and you know, the same, same story goes. So there is a pretty good uh, Lions of the East. Uh, you can Google that. Um, uh, there's a fellow that uh, is a, a Boston videographer that put together a nice show on Lions of the East. And I encourage you to, uh, to take a look at that if you want more information on it. Thank yes. you. I consider it a very fortunate thing to have seen because it didn't, what you just explained with the way that the body movement and everything does not, is not what I saw. You yeah. know, so it was just, it's, um, I, I feel like I was very, very fortunate to see what I saw, even if it was just traveling through. Thank you very much. It was a great program tonight. Okay. You bet, Marie. All right. Well, I wish you all a pleasant evening and uh, look forward to getting out and seeing some things up close and personal on Saturday. Hey, is the second show sold?